Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm pretty nervous about today's lecture because there are a lot of things that are sensitive in the area of large language models and ChatGPT and other forms of LLMs that people have been playing with and, and developing and using, um, in part because I'm gonna show you sort of what I use it for, and I know that there will be some people who are like, how dare you use it for that? You should be you know, writing out these tedious things by yourself. And the other, the other, <laughs> the other scary thing is that I don't wanna give students license, I don't wanna give you all license to like cheat, right? Because that's the primary thing that you think about with the intersection of ChatGPT and academia. But these are tools that, that exist. They are extremely helpful. And they're helpful in the way that, in many ways, that internet search and Wikipedia are useful. It just happens to be a much more consolidated version of kind of what's out there. So I started uh, this lecture by just asking ChatGPT for a prompt to describe itself. Can you explain to a non-CS major in one paragraph how ChatGPT works? Certainly, it always starts with certainly or something. ChatGPT, like other advanced language models, is a type of artificial intelligence that's been trained to understand and generate human-like text. It works by analyzing vast amounts of text data from books, websites, and other written sources to learn patterns in language. When you ask it a question or give it a prompt, ChatGPT uses this training to predict and assemble the most likely sequence of words to form a coherent and relevant response. Think of it as having read an enormous library of information, then using that knowledge to compose replies, though it's important to remember that it doesn't have personal experiences or access to real-time information, although that may change at some point in the near future especially the last point, real-time information, essentially ChatGPT is like a very sophisticated pattern recognition system that simulates human conversation based on the data it's been trained on. There are ways that academics used to do stuff and still do that are kind of like ChatGPT. For instance, you can ask Twitter or X a question and you can outsource information. You can outsource the asking of information to your Twitter followers. And that can sometimes give you a pretty, a, you know, pretty useful, uh, a, a useful answer. You can talk to an expert. You can, talk to, you can go to a conference. You can talk to, uh, to, to friends. You can ask a, uh, you know, a digital assistant or somebody who, uh, who might, uh, or a research assistant, somebody who might work with you that you can send an email to say, can you, can you work uh, on this? But there's something about the infinite bandwidth, not in a technical sense, but in a, uh, <laughs> very much not in a technical sense, but in a conversational sense that you can just keep asking ChatGPT and it's fast, it will not get tired of you asking it questions. It's just such a useful tool. And let me show you, uh, let's uh, del delve another ChatGPT word a little bit farther into uh, what I mean. Okay, this is what my ChatGPT subscription looks like. On the side, you have these different chats that are uh, that are uh, that I'm that are represent different conversations I'm having with ChatGPT at a given time, and let's I was I've been writing a grant proposal on efferent fibers in the skin. So there are two types of nerve fibers. There are afferent fibers, which take sensory information from the periphery and bring it to the central nervous system and thence the brain. Then there are efferent fibers or efferent fibers, but I think they say efferent sometimes to differentiate it from afferent, otherwise it sounds like the same thing. Efferent fibers are like muscle neurons, so neurons, motor neurons that connect to the muscles. They're also connected to uh, sweat glands and hair follicles to give 
uh, like the goosebump response. There are parasympathetic and sympathetic nerve fibers that are connected to, uh, to endocrine structures and, and, and so forth. So anyway, I'm like, this is like a very smart medical encyclopedia, neurobiology encyclopedia. I just ask it about things. When I don't understand something, I'll ask it, say, I didn't understand that part. Can you explain what you meant by that? And it's like an expert in this area. Now, granted, it's not very much beyond like textbook knowledge, but it is kind of far beyond, but, it, but it's a very good textbook knowledge. It's like, you can use this information to pass the MCAT or the US medical licensing exam. Like this is real stuff and it's really useful and it's really, really fast. Moreover, I actually find the explanations much more transparent to my eyes than a similar article on Wikipedia, which is written oftentimes by an uber nerd on that topic, and they will go into exhaustive detail where you stop understanding the Wikipedia article after the second sentence, and that totally happens to me, especially if it's in an area that's far beyond my core expertise in chemistry. Okay, down here, this is where it starts getting embarrassing. Letter of recommendation draft. So what I will do is oftentimes on walks to get my step count up is I will have a student's resume. So a student asks me to write a letter of recommendation and I will go through the resume and using voice to text, I will say, I have known this student for five years. They were in my class. They were a member of my research lab. We worked on this extra extracurricular thing and then here are some points I'd like to cover from their resume or CV and I'll just voice to text that whole thing and I will cut and paste that voice to text into ChatGPT. Now granted I kind of wrote the letter already. I wrote it by dictating it which is a lot faster than writing it but when you dictate something you use a lot of non-words, a lot of ums and ahs and sometimes the dictation software mishears you or it doesn't know what that word is. So what you can do is paste it into ChatGPT and say, turn this into an organized letter of recommendation. Also, I dictated this text, so, fix, so find and fix all the voice to text errors and it will do it. What would have taken me an hour has now taken me 10 minutes. Manuscript review. I will, so one of the things that scientists do is they, uh, they are often asked to peer review manuscripts and it takes a long time. And if, and so what I usually, what I, in the before time, what I would do is have the PDF of the thing open and then the supporting information and then so like, like notes that I would then go back into Microsoft Word and, um, and type up. Like I would take some notes and then I would transform it into, a, into, a, um, uh, into the, the critique of the, uh, of the paper. And so now what I do is I, same thing with letter of recommendation, I take notes I keep it as anonymous as possible because I don't want open AI, despite the fact that they say all this stuff disappears as soon as you put it in there. I don't want to expose, uh, I don't want to like divulge any, um, any information that, uh, that is proprietary. So I will say, I will use general comments about what the paper is about and my criticism. Then I'll go back in and then I'll add the details because I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to give open AI stuff that they shouldn't have. But still, it saves a lot of time. It gets the structure right. I've recently been interested in the photoacoustic effect and the use of the photoacoustic effect in projection haptics, so haptic holography. And when you have a scientific idea and you want to know 
what's been done before, you can do an exhaustive liter literature search or you can get 80% of the way there by asking ChatGPT. And it is, it doesn't know, it doesn't have, it's not trained on all of the scientific literature, unfortunately, um, although that's coming, I'm sure. Um, but it will, it will be able to have a useful conversation with you about the concept. It will also be able to, especially for older topics like photoacoustics, it can go back into more well-established literature like textbooks and things that it has been trained on. Neuroscience, uh, other types of, of uh, this sort of service asks, asks, and then transfer student curriculum. This is my file for this course. <laughs> and so when I'm giving a lecture and I want to make sure that I've thought 360 degrees around that topic, I'll never get completely 360 degrees around the topic, but if there are things that I haven't thought of in the the day, the days leading up to the lecture, I will put the topic in some of the things that I want to cover, and then I will ask it for things that I might have missed. You can even ask it to make the slides for you. <laughs> There's a nice little feature here in, uh, I'm not sure if this is in the free version. I have the $20 a month ChatGPT subscription but it allows you to put in some personalized information that allow you to, it, it tailors the responses. One of the things that is annoying about ChatGPT is it always hedges. It always says, please check with a medical provider before you take the advice you know, written in here, or always check the literature if, if it's about some scientific thing, or never take financial advice from me. <laughs> and so on. And so I said, I generally know that scientific and medical advice must be verified, so extensive hedging is not necessary, as ChatGPT likes to do at the end of each response. So just with that change, it eliminates all that hedging. How would you like ChatGPT to respond? And because I ask it for assistance with a lot of, like, letters and things, I say, in general, ChatGPT tends to use the word delve too much. Ugh. Certainly and delve. If, you, if something you read has certainly and delve in it, it was written by ChatGPT. Anyway, in letters, it also writes to, in too flowery a tone with over-the-top superlatives, etc., etc. In general, I don't write this way. I like to stick to the facts, use comparison groups, and emphasize what the evidence says, not just... This is, and it's, it's not just letters of recommendation. It's, um, you know, if I'm working with it to try to come up with a, a paragraph for a bio sketch that's bespoke to the particular grant that I'm submitting, and it'll say, Professor Lapomi is did groundbreaking research in this coolest thing ever, and, and I don't want it to do any of that. Just the facts, just the facts. There are also instances where there has been other proprietary information that, um, that I will absolutely will not put into uh, an open source cloud platform, um, even though, I don't know, probably Google has been hacked and everyone has everything already. But, but anyway, like if there's anything related to IP, anything related to um, to someone's grant proposal or technical details from a paper, like the, those are those are out of bounds um, because you're not you, you can't just feed it this this stuff, especially if it's somebody else's stuff. Okay. I was talking to a student in my lab the other day, and uh, we had our one-on-one -on -one meeting, and I said, I'm going to have ChatGPT help me make this presentation on ChatGPT. And she's like, you should wait to the end of the presentation to tell the class that you had ChatGPT help you make the presentation. And I thought, 
Uh, that would feel really dirty if I did that. So I'm just going to come out and say it, that the following slides were produced by ChatGPT, but I have my own commentary that I want to make. It's also funny to see how the slides produced by ChatGPT actually betray some of the biases of ChatGPT and some of its weird idiosyncrasies. So this is the prompt I gave it. I plan on giving my next talk on the use of LLMs to assist undergraduates in their studies. I want to focus on the use, of, uh, use as a bes bespoke tutor or study aid and not as a means of cheating. How should one use LLMs like ChatGPT? What are its strengths and weaknesses? Can it do math and arithmetic? What types of data was it trained on and how does it work? Also, some of the ways I use it. I have a chat going for every project in my portfolio. These include for my classes, for suggestions for slide design, grant proposals, bouncing ideas off it, getting suggestions for experiments, letters of recommendation. You can feed an LLM voice to text word salad and it comes up with something good. You can also dump a whole resume into it and reporting requirements like annual reports for grants. You can dump polished abstracts into it. These are ones that I have written that are already publicly available, so I'm not sharing anything with it that's proprietary. I just want to make sure that that's clear. Can you generate 12 slides with five bullets each for a presentation? You can feel free to reorganize it in the most logical order. And then I got those, and then I said, oh, wait, I forgot something. Thanks. One, it likes you when you say thanks. One more slide on the special power in writing algorithms in almost any coding language, which is a really cool uh, use case for LLMs. All right, as academic tools, uh, high level language understanding and generation. Yeah, it's pretty it's good at that. Ability to process and summarize large texts. So you know the first company going out of business as, ah, first company going out of business as a result of ChatGPT is Cliff Notes because this, this is it. Like, it'll even take something that there's no cliff notes on and it'll summarize a summary. Generation of, cre I'm, okay, I'm, let me, disclaimer here. Do whatever your instructor tells you. Whatever the limit of <laughs> use that, that, uh, that they prescribe is what you should follow. You never take something from ChatGPT and try to pass it off as your own work. Facts, okay. Organization, okay. Arguments, no. Um, that, to me, crosses a, uh, crosses a line. So generation of creative ideas and solutions. Eh, if the instructor is asking you for a creative idea or solution and you get it from ChatGPT, that, to me, is, is academic non-integrity. Support in language learning and writing. This is so good for English for students who speak English as a second language or who write English as a second language or for students who want some help improving the clarity of their prose. I think a good writer is a lot better of a writer than ChatGPT, but if you are, um, if it doesn't come naturally to you, you can learn a lot from the way that it structures sentences and the way that it puts sentences in the correct order, which is a big part of good writing called coherence, where one idea flows logically one to the next. Accessibility and ease of use. Yeah, you can double tap control and you can just talk into it. Recognizing the limitations. It has the serious potential for generating incorrect or biased information. It's just a, it's statistics. It uses statistics at its core, right? It's not actually thinking. Is that what happened when they tried to use it on the court case or something like yeah, that? Yeah, so there's a famous case where it came up with all these fake legal precedents and, uh, <laughs> and that lawyer, I don't know if they were disbarred or what, but um, totally uh, wrecked their reputation. Lack of deep understanding or reasoning. Uh, <laughs> whether it understands at all is probably a philosophical debate we could, we could have. Inability to access external up-to-date information. Okay, so it has whatever it has in it, it has baked into it. In another project that I have based on my nanoengineering teaching, we're actually developing an API, which is an application uh, <laughs> uh, program interface 
that uh, where my textbook for that course is baked into the API, which itself sits on GPT-4. So there is a way to get other information into it, um, but it's not going to be in the in the base the base LLM. Dependency on the quality of input data. And this is the same thing with any model, any computational model at all, any model at all. The assumptions that go in dictate the quality of the response. They call it garbage in, garbage out. In my group, we do a lot of molecular simulation. We, we work with uh, specialists who do molecular simulation, where you need to know where all the charges and dipoles and van der Waals forces in one molecule or one part of one molecule are interacting with the others, so you know how it folds or you know how it sticks to something or whatever. But if you plug in Coulomb's law wrong into the model, you're going to get a completely wrong thing, right? So garbage in, garbage out. If you if it's not trained on something that's correct, and I guarantee it was trained on a lot of things that not everyone would agree with. Although they tried really hard to get high quality sources, you can't always guarantee that. Ethical considerations and risks of misuse. I'm gonna say this again, don't put anything in there that is personal or proprietary, or that if it were, if it were, on the front page of the New York Times or the San Diego Union Tribune, it would embarrass you. <laughs> so especially, you can put whatever your own information you want. That's just you know what your risk tolerance says. But if it's anything that originated with anybody else, don't do it. Don't do it. Risks of misuse, and that has to do with academic integrity, is Right, if you take the prompt from the professor, instructor, and you just cut and paste it right into ChatGPT and submit that. <laughs> it doesn't even work that well that way. One, it gives you very short answers. It gives you very non-specific answers. If you're going to have it help you write something, you want to be very specific. It'll, it works better that way. More of your own ideas shape its output and you can view it more as a as an encyclopedia than as something that's going to complete an assignment for you all right many of you are in math computer science engineering chemistry physics biology where you have a lot of math and, and courses that require a lot of arithmetic it has only basic arithmetic capabilities right now in 2023. GPT-4 will get arithmetic wrong for sure. How do I know that? Because in my last textbook, I wanted to see how GPT-able <laughs> my problems that I came up with were. And so I put some of them in and I wanted to see what the output was. And in many cases, it's off by orders of magnitude. It gets, and what's funny is that it's unclear as to what it's actually doing when it's trying to calculate arithmetic, like to do a numerical problem because it's only based on language. Um, but you can eventually convince it to go to the right answer. You can also sometimes convince it to go to an answer that's even wronger than it was before if you really want to mess with it. Yeah, just said that. Uh, it is useful in explaining mathematical concepts. Like if you want to know what the divergence or curl of a function is, it will explain it to you in words in a very useful way. Um, and I kind of gave this example of this of, a, of an unsuccessful math assistance. And so anything math related, you need to double check that. You don't use it as a calculator, at least in 2023. I happen to believe that this is a trivial fix for future versions uh, because all you need to do is put Mathematica on top of it and it'll do it. But anyway, that's where it is right now. Training data and knowledge base. 
the source of the training data for uh, large language models. They're not entirely transparent all the time as to where the training data comes from. You have an idea that like professionally produced encyclopedias are definitely baked in. Some of the peer reviewed literature, lots of textbooks, um, lots of popular, like it knows a lot about popular songs. So over the summer, I, uh, I saw ACDC's first um, first live performance in seven years. And I just had a question. I'm like, how many famous ACDC songs were written in the Brian Johnson era versus the Bon Scott era? And I just <laughs> listed them and like, anyway, how, how would, what was it trained on that it knew that? Anyway, the role of large data sets in performance. So the larger the data set, the better it will do. Limitations due to cutoff dates. So oftentimes it'll tell you, due, due to limitations in my training of January of 2022, blah, blah, blah. I don't know this answer. Sometimes there might be biased or unverified data sources that are baked in that are on which it was trained. And you, yes, another caveat. And this is typical of ChatGPT because I got this slide from ChatGPT. Cross cross-check me, it says, which is absolutely true. Okay, if you wanna use the LLM in your undergraduate studies uh, and revision of text, summarize and explain, it explains comp complex concepts. So just like, you know, divergence and curl and efferent nerve fibers, you just ask it, right? It's a lot easier than than the really dense stuff that's written in Wikipedia or the garden paths you can go on on Google or YouTube. It tends to get to the point a lot faster. It can assist with essay and report writing. You think about it like, you know, like I talked about the way you consider your textbook or your instructor to be an expert witness. ChatGPT is kind of like an expert witness. Like say, what do you think about this? What, you know, how would, how would you, you know, can you think of any examples of when this, uh, of uh, how hydrogen and carbon bond or something, or how Napoleon was influenced by Robespierre or something? I don't know, just making, making stuff up outside of my field. Generating practice questions and scenarios. This, this is, this is great. Come up with an with a uh, come up with an interview question that I'm likely to get at uh, if I'm applying for an internship at the San Diego Union Tribune. Come up with ten interview questions. Come up with ten questions about the movement of an object on an inclined plane and the direction of forces. Come up with ten acid base equilibrium questions come up with with anything it'll it'll do it they won't all be great but they'll be pretty good especially in those more intro level classes um, once you get farther on into grad school you know it might not be as good at this question generation stuff it can enhance your study efficiency and comprehension because sometimes comprehension is a function of how many different ways you see something explained and how often you see it. And GPT is awesome at that. You know, you can just say regenerate the explanation and every time you do it, it'll come up with something different. Or you can say, I really like cooking or music. And so come up with an explanation for this in a way that's relevant to somebody that has those interests and it'll, it'll do it. And it'll help you come up with mnemonics too. The way that you interact with it, this is a lot like the garbage in, garbage out thing. They call this prompt engineering. And first I thought that term was kind of BS. I'm like, you're just typing into a chat bot. That's not engineering. But the, there is a way of asking it with precision and creating boundary conditions for it that make it much more useful. And it can even be something similar like using no jargon, using the level of a fifth grade textbook, using the level of a first year graduate student textbook. And suppose 
you're going into a new field or you're working with someone outside of your field, you can tell it, first open up a new chat window because you don't want it to get confused as to what else went on. Um, as you say, this is, these are my priors, like this is my background. Um, explain this to me in a way you think I'd understand. Some of this is, uh, is redundant. So personalized learning, we talked about that. Assistance with language learning. It's good in other languages too, um, in, some, in some cases besides English. It has uh, support for a wide range of subjects and topics, everything from chemistry to, uh, to 70s metal bands. Encouraging active learning and critical thinking. So again, it works best if you're working with it not if you just ask it to generate something. The need for human oversight and learning. Yeah, so take everything it gives you with a grain of salt. In some cases, a kilogram of salt. We talked about the differentiation between assistance and cheating. There's a big difference in where you talk to it and then you write your uh, you write your essay versus write the essay for me. Same thing. Uh, yeah, they didn't really. ChatGPT didn't really come up with a good slide for this because I covered all of these things. A lot of redundancy here. What are some practical applications in research and academia? Assistance with grant proposal development. This is the same thing as always. You don't take chunks that were written by ChatGPT and put it directly into the grant because one, it'll be kind of obvious. It won't have the right tone. It'll look like ChatGPT wrote it. But you can have a conversation, especially if there's a part where I need some help with experimental design and you're stuck and you're like, how, how would one do this? and gives you some ideas. You can even say, give me 10 ideas, and then you take the best two. <laughs> and you're like, and I will expand on these here. I do a lot of writing by dictation. And I actually find, although I created the content, ChatGPT is good at taking those words and making it more coherent and eliminating speech to text errors. Enhancing the design and content of academic presentations. Yeah, so one time I had to do a, uh, an overview figure for a presentation and I had multiple parts and ChatGPT can't generate a PowerPoint slide. It can't do the graphics yet, although it will eventually. There's Dolly, but that's a little bit different. Um, but it will give you ideas on placement, how to catch the eye and a lot of the ideas will not be great, but it will get you thinking. It'll jumpstart that, uh, that writer's block that you can feel. Drafting and refining letters of recommendation. So it's not the case that it will just write a believable, well, depending on, <laughs> depending on how unethical a letter writer you want to be, and you just say, write a letter for person X. And, uh, and it won't know anything about that person and it'll write something because it, unlike a human being, it will always give you an answer. Um, so really you need to say so-and-so and you can be anonymous if, you're, if you can't give the name, if you don't want to give a name to OpenAI um, and, uh, and, it will, and it will take your word salad. Okay. Future of LLMs in education. So there's something called Baumol's cost disease, which says that in industrial sectors and economic sectors with low labor productivity, salaries and costs rise out of proportion to the work that we actually do. What does that mean? It means that in education and healthcare and other elements of the service economy, when you have 
one professor, you can teach 100 students. You have two professors, you can teach 200 students, where there's a monotonic relationship between the number of professors you have and the number of professors you can, or the number of students you can reach. Whereas in manufacturing, because technology gets better over time, you have one person can make two cars, then one person can make, then two people can make, uh, or rather one person can make 100 cars, and then a few years later, one person can make 1,000 cars, and so on, and so on, and so on, that one industrial sector, one economic sector goes like this, and the other one goes like this in terms of individual productivity. However, the people in this column and the people in this column have to be part of the same society. <laughs> And so they have to get paid commensurately, even though my job as a professor, I can't do it any better um, because, like, as time goes on, because I'm just talking to rooms of students. However, LLMs have the potential to break this model in a way that's never been done before, in my opinion. Because you can get an LLM to teach at massive scale. You can also get it to do personalized learning, and you can also do it to promote mastery learning. Mastery learning is where you can't go on to the next step unless you have learned everything there is to know in the first step or learn 90% of what there is to know in the first step. It's like, here, build a house, but I've never poured concrete before or used a hammer. But in academia, we say, learn fluid mechanics, but you got a C minus in dif differential equations, no problem. But what bespoke, bespoke means personalized. Personalized education driven by large language models allow you to bake in that kind of mastery-based learning in a way that's impossible with a traditional classroom setting. A lot of ethical and practical considerations for future use. I think everyone is concerned uh, these days about deep fakes where you can have the words come out in the style of the person that's talking. Like if you give it enough transcripts of this class, you could come up with an AI that talks like me, uses the words that I use, uses the lecture style that I use, and then all you need is some uh, less fake looking Princess Leia from, uh, from Rogue One talking in real time the words generated by an LLM and then who knows what's real and what's not. So certainly there are practical considerations, but you could also resurrect like Ada Lovelace or Isaac Newton. And you could say like Ada Lovelace, first computer programmer, you could create her from, from LLMs and then you could interact based on stuff that she had said and written using her lifelike avatar, right? So it goes both ways. Maybe a deep fake would be a really good way to do bespoke education. Like, I would love to have a conversation with Einstein. Yeah. Are you filming this? Yeah. So you're, you're done? You're making your model right now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, it's funny that you mentioned that. A couple, like last year, I actually took, so, I have a lot of professional development seminars that I've given, and I got, I just downloaded transcripts of all of them, and I have not made the fake me yet, but um, it's uh, maybe someday. <laughs> My textbook has a fake me, um, because we're working on that on the side, but it's a written version. Yeah, you can only, if you have a photograph, it's easy to do the talking mouth already. Yeah. It's open source. Yeah. But I was thinking about losing it. <laughs> it's really exciting, right? I mean, not to not to go, you know, hog wild on this, but like mRNA technology, LLMs, CRISPR, like what a time to be alive. Pretty amazing, right? And we thought that 
all these basic scientific discoveries had kind of petered out, but there have been a few in the last just couple of years that have just made so much possible. And it's scary, but it's also, uh, it's also exciting. It said final thoughts and open floor for questions, but then I said I need another slide on computer programming. <laughs> So it's really good with a lot of different, like I can just, so I'm not a CS person at all. And you can probably tell by the way that I talk about uh, ChatGPT that I'm, that I'm not. The only uh, experience coding I had was um, in uh, 1993 when I was 10 years old. I did some, uh, I tried to figure out how QBasic games that came with Windows 3.1 worked. And then I made my own QBasic games. That was the last bit of, and they were really, really crappy. And that was the last programming that I ever did until I wrote my textbook, which I did all in LaTeX, which is like baby coding. And um, it actually made it easier to feed into <laughs> the API for ChatGPT. Um, but there are certain cases where like, how do I write out this equation so it looks good in LaTeX? And so I just explained it to ChatGPT and it poops out the LaTeX code. So you can just say, write an algorithm for a blah, blah, blah in Python, it'll do it. It's really good with debugging. It's really good to explain code. So you can put code in it that you find and it will tell you what it's trying to do. And that's super useful. That would have been really useful to me as a 10 year old looking through uh, <laughs> the preloaded games in, um, in QBasic. And customization. So it will work with you to improve your, your code. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take questions to the extent that I can answer them without access to ChatGPT. Chat